Here we are to observe the podcaster in their natural habitat. As we gather around the podcast player, we hope to catch some of the tasty morsels of information that the podcaster may have discarded. Let us calmly observe so that we do not disturb the podcasters during their ritual. Hello and welcome to the Linux Lads. My name is Connor and with us today we have Mike. Hi people. And Shane. Hello. So, Shane, what have you been up to during this past while? Uh, me, I've still been uh, getting to grips with uh, KDE Neon. Um, so, like we were talking about before we began recording, um, it's a different experience to what I'm used to, for sure. It's uh, it's it's a it's a completely different philosophy to to gnome or, or anything else I've tried. Uh, there's it's it's like let's pack as much options and as much information into everything as we can, but like at the same time, it's very it's structured very logically. Um, it's kind of a nerd's dream, really. It's uh, there's just configuration options everywhere for everything. But that said, the menus make sense. Like uh, I've never found myself coming up against any difficulty when I've tried to do anything. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know, who knows, I could be sick of it in two weeks time and just go back to GNOME, which could happen, but like, whatever, that's the beauty of Linux, isn't it? I, I, I pretty much exactly. Um, the, that's the whole thing is a lot of us are distro hoppers until we settle on something. And even if we settle on something, it could we could settle on something for six months and then something new and shiny comes up we're like ooh i've not tried that out in a while so yeah it's the never-ending story of the distro hopper so mike what have you been up to i've been too busy with work to do much more other stuff but uh i was showing somebody well i was working with someone and i was showing her a some task that i do and she was I think pretty taken aback by the uh, by the way you can use uh, Vim to do uh, a lot of editing on a bunch of things extremely fast. So, uh, so I think I was advocating a little bit there for uh, Vim and Linux in general because that kind of specifically this kind of thing would be very difficult to do on Windows. Uh, Unless you install them, if I do, and I don't know if that's the thing. That's actually a thing. And what I've been up to is well, not much in relation to the Linux side. Um, I had a friend of mine coming over from Arizona, so that was, uh, and it, I took two days off in order to make a a four day long weekend out of it. So a lot of all the tourist shite that you normally do in Dublin. So the Guinness Storehouse. The, uh, the various museums, the Natural History Museum, the National Archaeological Museum. Um, what else did we get to, up to? Oh yeah, the the Trinity Library, which I do actually recommend. It's it's fourteen euro, which is a bit steep, but you can spend as much time as you want in there. Some people literally spent the fourteen euro and just walked straight through it, like spent like five or ten minutes walking straight through it. I think I spent like literally an hour taking photographs in there. So there's no. Uh, sense of urgency there's nobody kind of pushing you along saying no you you have to get out of here or whatever uh yeah you can literally spend hours in there if you want is that um, the, so it is is that the long hall in trinity yeah the long the long library or the long room or whatever they oh, call so, it. yeah it's, it's amazing it's breathtakingly beautiful it's uh it's seriously something out of hogwarts and i uh, i think there was a um, controversy there the Trinity people thinking that uh, the, pe the Hogwarts library was inspired by it or whatever. I think it was uh, the Star Wars. Uh, actually, it was George Lucas who who inspired himself uh, when he was creating Star Wars. I'm not sure exactly which, but I think it's like the Jedi place in one of the one of the earlier uh, Star Wars movies was modeled after the uh, after the Trinity library. It's it's absolutely unreal. Uh, I mean, just. The, it's the whole sensory experience I mean i'm sure you can see the awe of it in photographs but when you're there and uh, just the smell of it everything just the whole experience of it i'd highly recommend it um but i would highly recommend spending a decent amount of time there in order to get your your money's worth because 14 euro is a bit steep if you're only spending like five five or ten minutes in the place um 
but yeah, there's no rush. There's no I, as I, as I said, I think we literally spent an hour to an hour and a half just walking around. This it's it's not a particularly long room or a big room. Well, it's it's fairly big, but like to spend an hour in a room is pretty, is a lot. So, but we literally walked around, then sat down for a while, then walked around a bit more, sat down for a while in order to get our money's worth, and it was well worth it. Um, and I remember on the last podcast I said that <laughs> I finally got my microphone working, and then. As soon as I stopped recording and listened back, I realized I was freaking recording on my, uh, on my webcam mic rather than my decent microphone, which this one is. I, so, pretty sure I'm still (laughs) recording on the right microphone now. Otherwise, I'm I'm a complete fucking idiot. But anyway, um, yeah, so after all my thing of saying I'm back on Linux and no more Windows and I'm recording on the right thing turns out it was not recording on the right thing but oh well so now that we've caught up uh, with each other whatever we've been up to in the last couple of while uh, I think we'll move on to our Azara coupon code so we have um, a coupon code for Azara VPN which they were kind enough to uh, give us when we asked Uh, (laughs) Which is thirty percent off three months. Um, so if you go on their website and sign up for their three month plan, uh, if you see code Linux Lads when you're ordering, don't forget to click the add code button, and then you'll get the discount. And that discount is valid up until the first of January twenty twenty. So that is a thirty percent off uh, the Azure VPN service when you sign up for three months and they're fairly nifty guys i mean they uh run debian on their own servers they own their own hardware it's not like they farm out their own hardware Um, they're based in sweden and the swedish government don't require them to log their, their traffic so they don't and they have uh locations all around the world including Nor- europe and north america uh, and they provide a wire guard option and WireGuard as well as OpenVPN and WireGuard is all this new hotness so if you fancy trying out WireGuard um, you have a nice 30% off a 3 month plan with Azure VPN so now moving on to the news so the first bit of news is uh, the article 13 has been passed in the EU parliament uh, so this is very controversial. Um, there's a uh, in our show notes we will have a breakdown of how the MEPs voted uh, in a PDF form, and apparently um, there's some confusion uh, among the MEPs as to what they're voting voting on, whether they're voting on the actual thing or whether they're voting on it to be uh, uh, scheduled for another time or something like that. Um, so Mike. What are your thoughts? Uh, well, I think the confusion there was, as pointed in a Guardian article, that uh, the MEPs wanted to add some amendments that would uh, make that would break down the vote, so Articles 11 and 13 would be voted on separately, and uh, they had a vote about adding the amendments and not and or not, and some of the MPs who wanted to add the amendments didn't uh, vote it against it somehow they got confused i'm not sure how it works there i always imagine there would be two buttons maybe one green one red but it's probably more involved in taking confused like this so if that if that didn't happen if there was no confusion there could have been a vote on those articles separately and maybe they wouldn't have passed uh, maybe we can just briefly say what they are so the bulk of the or the most controversial stuff in the law it's it's a whole law that has got other stuff in it but the the articles 11 and 13 respectively one of them aims to strengthen the copyright protections for uh, news publishers against reusing their stuff so if you if you share a new a piece of news on your site you should the news publishers are worried that they don't get the revenue from the visit because the visit doesn't happen because you you know you basically take the, the stuff that they worked on and to really publish it and the article 13 uh, res- increases responsibility of internet companies to pre- that to prevent their platform from being used for copyright infringement so there's link tax in article 11 so you'd have to pay if you want to link to a piece of news 
I think, if I remember it properly, and uh, content filters in Article 13. So if you have a, if you have a site that shares video, you would be responsible for there not being any pirated content. And I mean, the repercussions of this are big. This is a massive change. There are many people who think that this is definitely the, a bad thing to do. Uh, it's it's going to pass. I think now it's going to be to the national national parliaments to to ratify it for each country. So that's that's I think where it's at. Yeah, I think um, it's it's. I've I've been seeing some stories in the news over the last week or two, um, specifically in the Guardian, um, where that was our source for the uh, the confusion around the voting in the European Parliament. Um, but I saw them publishing a few articles uh, from musicians like uh, Bjorn from ABBA and Debbie Harry as well. And I was like, uh, and I was like, oh, Blondie and Abba have a problem with it. Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> we've definitely lost. But uh, but yeah, I was like, uh, I, I, was, I was reading it going, yeah, from their perspective, it's very good and it's very important. But like, big picture here, like it's, uh, it's great for big publishers. It's great for, you know, it's great for reining in tech giants. <clears throat> that aspect of it, I kind of like, but at what cost? I mean, it's 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 typical politicians. They think that the solution to a technical problem is is far simpler than it actually is. They they don't really appreciate the the, the mechanisms within the system that that will have to be created created, and uh, it'll it'll just really stifle things. Like it's it's just not good news. I mean, hopefully the implementation in the member states has some leeway. And it's not quite as draconian at the member state level when it is implemented. But, you know, I just I just don't think they think technology is some kind of bloody magic bullet. It's just like, oh, yeah, we can slap a filter on that. We can slap a just write a computer program, computer man. And <laughs> like, uh, like that, that's that's not how it works. Well, let's not forget that the proponents of these things and the lobbyists are the same industries who try to stop uh Napster and Kaza uh, in the beginning of the 2000s and the ones who tried to stop the same people who were horrified by iTunes and who are still not very happy with things like Spotify and I think Netflix, right? So if I, if I, if I get it right, these are the same people who think that uh, they can f they they can silo away their content prevent people from sharing it which is a natural thing that SV people want to do so make it they and in effect make it very hard to use and they think people will still still be bothered to actually pay for that privilege i think what they don't realize is that not only they are making our lives harder and they are going to sink some good businesses and uh, destroy some communities wikipedia could be a massive victim of this for example but they are also going to damage themselves in the process. I mean, if, if uh, let's say, uh, New York Times publishes an article and they don't want me to share it, then, well, why would I even bother reading it? How would I even know about it until I read New York Times every day, which I don't? So if, if they want me to go to their side, they need and they have to be able to share what they've got. It's as easy as that. And if they don't understand it, and I singled New York Times not knowing which which they actually for in this debate, but if people think this is going to improve anything, including publishing and uh, content creators, they are, in my opinion, very badly mistaken. Uh, yeah, I, I honestly have not had that many uh, insights into it. Uh, from what I understand, uh, as as you're saying, is 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 just only hurting independent artists in the long run, and it's it's going straight to the the corporations. So it's pretty much all the the usual uh, antiquated lobby groups that have a, a lot of money and uh, can employ loads of people to constantly be saying, "Hey, MEP person, did you do you, do you know this? Do you know this? Do you know this?" Do you know? And it's just volume and. And then that's all that's in the the that MEP's mind is well, um, my general impression of this is that it's going to go it's it's this thing which could be a complete and utter f uh, falsitude or whatever, um, which is I suppose is the whole point of lobbying. But do we, yeah, you should, you, there should definitely be uh, uh, a not for profit or something like that uh, lobby group. Um, 
which I suppose there are there are there's the EDRI in in Europe, which I've a lot of time for, which is the uh, for pe- people listening in North America and unfamiliar with it is the probably rough approximate is the Euro- European equivalent of the EFF. Uh, so they're uh, a digital rights advocacy gr- uh, group and lobby group. So I would have a lot of time for the EDRI, um, and they're they're doing their best they can, but they can only do so much. I mean, uh, the 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 uh, uh, amount of money that they have versus the amount of money that the um, the like, for example, the record industry have or uh, telecommunications or whatever. Uh, because telecommunications are also co- now coming into the cable companies, which could be affected by this as well, whereas TV content or something like that. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's a whole it's a whole mess, and I don't really know where to where to even to begin. Um, to be honest. So with that, I suppose we'll move on to the next bit of news. Um, so if you want to get your Disco Dingo, the 1904 Beta uh, has come out, so no longer Alpha or Daily Images, or is it 90s or Dailies? Anyway, um, um, it's no longer uh, the early stages or the Alphas, you can now get a Beta. And I've used uh, Ubuntu Betas in the past, and they tend to be pretty solid for somebody who's um, anyway tech-savvy. Um, in other words, if if you're, you know, if you're informed enough to know that it's better and you're running it, and then all of a sudden you get this massive error coming up on your screen and your your computer is absolutely frozen, you have the knowledge to be able to wipe it and go back to uh, eighteen ten or eighteen o four or something like that. Um, you can you can you can pave essentially. Uh, once you have that knowledge that running a bed is, is perfectly fine and you might find that it's perfectly stable um, but I wouldn't recommend that you put this down in front of your granny because if you, if if her computer locks up then she'll go into a, a bit of a panic and you wouldn't know how to get herself out of that situation but um, for the tech savvy listeners out there uh, it might be something to check out uh, the 1904 beta and from what I can understand um, there's been vast uh, speed improvements with GNOME in the latest GNOME version and 1904 also comes out with the Linux 5.0 kernel so the very latest kernel and very latest hardware and security uh, updates um, inherent with that kernel so uh Shane, any thoughts on the this nineteen oh four beta coming out? Um I was going to try it. I haven't tried it yet, but um it does look very nice. <clears throat> nice and uh I was looking at the updates to Gnome Shell and, and stuff and uh yeah, like l- like they mentioned in the article that we uh that we have in the notes, um it's it's a very incremental update and it's not not groundbreaking by any stretch. Uh, there are some good updates good uh, additions in there like the fractional scaling in gnome um and that that is handy because i've got a a 1440p monitor and i do get that issue sometimes with uh, linux distros um so uh yeah things will just look wrong like it'll the scaling will be all wrong um so that's that's good to see um also uh yeah just the look of it in general is very nice um yeah, I've never really used Ubuntu for any length of time in the past, but yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm happy to give it a go in VirtualBox or something like that and see see what it's like. Um, who knows? In two weeks, when I get sick of KDE Neon, I could go to Ubuntu. Mike, I think you were saying in the group chat that you have downloaded and possibly have tried out this 1904 beta. Uh, I've tried a daily release. I'm not sure what's the difference between the two of them, but uh, it uh, I've. I think, I think if you install a, a daily and then just do all your updates, it's effectively the same thing. And uh, oh. yeah, it, it everything seemed to work. Everything was very nice. Um, I gave it about half an hour. Say so it looks like just another solid Ubuntu release that we are all getting used to. And uh, you know, it has got. I'm I'm really in favor of uh, speed improvements. And uh, you know, Ubuntu is the probably most important desktop. Uh, Linux distribution, so I'm happy to see them progressing in a great way. 
Uh, yeah, I would certainly agree with that. I mean, there are there are certain certainly some large contenders such as uh, Fedora, which is has the backings of Red Hat and now the backings of IBM behind it. Um, so they're exactly not short of the of the dosh either. But I think the the company that seems to put most of its focus. Uh, or put the most focus, I should say, rather than uh, most of its focus, the most fo- focus and the most emphasis on just little things, the usability, the de- average desktop user is definitely canonical with, uh, with Ubuntu. Little things like, um, you know, adding your printer, adding uh, Bluetooth devices, uh, the, uh, the fractional scaling, I, I, I don't know who... Uh, because I don't have access to uh, the internal mailing list of the of the GNOME developers, but I don't know who proposed this or was whether it was canonical or whether it was somebody from uh, the Red Hat team or even somebody from, let's say, uh, OpenSUSE or something like that. Um, but uh, I would say I'll, uh, probably a lion's share of the development would probably have come from the canonical team. Again, this is all speculation because they don't have access to the internal uh, mailing list of the GNOME developers. So uh, I do not know um, uh, where the imp- impetus came for uh, that fractional scale- scaling uh, improvement came from. But in general, the fact that uh, Ubuntu have taken up, uh, go reverted back to GNOME um, versus Unity means that there there are uh, uh, some skilled skilled developers who are contributing back to something that uh, previously was just uh, uh, Red Hat and Fedora and possibly OpenSUSE and uh, maybe uh, Arch developers or a few others. Uh, but it was now it's it's just another big company that's contributing to it, which is only can be good, and they're contributing to the same product. So I think those the those refinements are starting to to show fruit now uh, with Canonical's contributions. So tangentially related, something that uh, isn't based off GNOME shell, but is based off uh, GTK. GTK3 uh, and is based off the GNOME stack but a different implementation of it there is a new version of Solus. Solus 4 has finally coming out and hell has frozen over. <laughs> I think they I think they were on 3.9999999 for absolutely ages because they're afraid to do drop the big uh, Solus 4 uh, so um, from what I'm, I'm just looking at the article here. From what I can see, it's some nice refinements, um, almost in the same vein as the uh, the latest GNOME release, where it's just kind of nicely refined and nice, and just little niceties. Uh, it seems to be that the uh, the Solus release is the the exact same, just kind of nice UI improvements, nice little. Uh, usability improvements uh lick, lick, just little things here and there it's kind of a nice refined mature release so anyone who likes uh, uh budgie i'd recommend that you check it out and of course budgie is, cl- is cross pl- cross platform there's ubuntu budgie you can install it on arch you can install it on various other things so it's not just on solus but uh, uh also uh it's i think you're they're coming up to the latest the very well not the late, very latest kernel but uh, up to the 420 kernel so you should be getting some security patches and uh, hardware improvements as well yeah it's so, just been Shane. yeah i've just been looking at the screenshots um uh it's it does obviously it does look very nice um my issue with uh solus i guess has always been uh application support so you kind of have to run everything That's in true. a snap um which i'm not a fan of um i i, I kind of like to have uh apps integrated um into the in, into the stack of the os um, i'm not a fan of these containerized apps um i know they're popular with, with many at the moment but they're just not my kind of thing um there is one cool interesting thing i see here in budgie though that's a uh, caffeine mode um that's kind of interesting um so that introduces a new applet called caffeine mode so it makes sure that when you're when you're kind of doing stuff and you're in the in zone that you know your screen doesn't dim or like uh you know your 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 computer doesn't you know go into hibernation or anything like that while you're working so that is kind of cool 
um, it turns your display brightness up to max <laughs> or a designated brightness level. So that's kind of nifty. Um, very unpleasant on the eyes though, I can imagine. Um, but yeah, really, really pretty distro, very solid, you know, very sensibly put together. Yeah. All the, all the lads uh, have done a great job. One point of clarification: I I have used uh, Solus in the past, uh, and the it's a, it's not based on anything else. I mean, a lot of new distros are based off Debian or the they're based off Arch or there's the they based off a pre existing distro. This is its own thing from from the ground up, and it has its own package manager. So it actually it does have its own native uh, store and native applications. It's just the 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 package manager. Uh, itself, I believe, had to had uh, was either there wasn't a lot of natively compiled applications. So sometimes what it would do is it would g get an application that was compiled for something else and then uh, like compile it uh, from scratch. And I believe if you try to install Google Chrome on it, it absolutely took a, an absolute fucking age. Um, so and I I bear witness to that I was, when I was trying it out Solus I was like oh cool uh, uh, Google Chrome appears to be uh, available for this install why is Google Chrome taking ages um, so I believe there's improvements on on that uh, side of things where you try to install a native application and I believe that was also why they embraced um, snaps and flatbacks so readily is the it was nicely containerized they could it would it greatly improve the install times and, and things like that so like like when most distros where you're Debian Arch uh, Ubuntu uh, Fedora or OpenSUSE or whatever you, you, you do ha it does have um, snap and flatpak support, which um, is quite useful. So, in the next bit of news, um, Steam has come out with a redesign, and I've been looking through this article here, and it is a certainly a, a vast improvement as from what I can see. Um, Steam, I'm not I'm not saying it's a bad user interface. It's just it it's work. It, it it's pleasant to look at and it works and it it does everything. I've no real complaints about it. It's just it's long on the tooth. So it's kind of something that it's in the background. I don't really think about it. It's it's simple and it does the job. And um, but this. Um, seems to be a quite nice redesign. So there, uh, there's definitely some artistic talent over there involved uh, when it comes to uh, uh, 2D interfaces and so on. Uh, obviously, the screenshots and everything will be in the article uh, listed in the show notes. I'm just uh, thumbing through these uh, these screenshots here, and it definitely does look like a, a nice improvement. One thing that is rumored, uh, I don't necessarily see it in the uh, in these screenshots. I'm uh, just looking, but one thing that's rumored is that the chat app is going to be integrated back into the main app, whereas at the moment it's its own floating window. Which, to yeah. be honest, drives my fucking head in. I hate that thing so much. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a nice design. Um, the fonts look really nice. That's one small thing that stuck out to me was the just the lettering and the fonts looks really good. Um, yeah, other than that, yeah, as you said, like the Steam client isn't something I ever really look at. I mean, I for a start, I don't game that much, but um, when I do, I just go in there to launch the game and I don't really pay much attention to it. But yeah, it's nice that it looks nicer. That's never a bad thing. Mike, any thoughts? Uh, I almost don't game at all. So it, for me, for me, basically, Steam is just a launcher for games. And I, I think I've bought games through it or through Humble Bundle. So yeah, any interf look, anything that makes uh, gaming on Linux better, even visually more appealing, yeah, I'm all for it, obviously. I appreciate that Valve has done a lot of work for for the Linux community uh, if, by just by including Linux as uh, a viable platform. Uh, personally, I don't really have any thoughts because uh, I don't use the Steam interface that much to, to actually even think about it. 
The next bit of news, uh, I'll touch on this briefly, but I think it's worth mentioning, is KD Connect is back in the Play Store. So I believe there was some controversy about uh, Google was updating its its policies and because KD Connect has access to your text messages in order to have them pop up on your desktop, um, this whole syncing aspect to it, I think they were running into controversy with Google and the Play Store, but uh, thankfully they resolved that and KD Connect is back in the Play Store. The next bit of news, uh, somewhat controversially, uh, Google is jumping into gaming with uh, what they're calling Google Stadia. And the basic rundown of this is they're going to use their massive servers and their massive computing capabilities to essentially stream a game to your browser. And they have visions in the future whether uh, uh, this will be able to be implemented as smoothly as they believe it will be is you're going to be watching a, a either a trailer for a game on YouTube or um, somebody playing the game on on YouTube, as in a, a let's play or or whatever, or somebody streaming the, their their game of on YouTube, and a little pop up will come up in the corner and saying, "Do you want to jump into this game?" And as long as you're paying the ten dollars a month, fifteen dollars a month, or whatever the service ends up being, they have visions of you just being able to click on it and, and then jumping into the game with your gamepad. Um, so what are your guys' thoughts on this? Well, uh, I I always hear that Google is trying to make something uh, It's uh, and it's meant to be really good for users. So basically, the way people were talking about this is A, there is going to be a game streaming service. B, it's good for Linux because it's going to run on Linux servers. So uh, whoever make game game studios are going to make... Uh, games for Linux because they would want them on this platform. And uh, three, there's going to be this integration that you were talking about. So you watch a video and you jump into the game. But for God's sake, it's Google. They have got, in my opinion, two massive things against them. One is that they cannot put together a nice interface to save their life. So whatever they do, (laughs) you know, they have this massive server power. But whatever they do, at least for me, is pretty much unusable, starting from Gmail, everything everything else, except Google search, which is just a simple bar that you type your search into. Every, and even that is somewhat screwed up by the way they, they show you the results. So I don't believe that they will do it properly or that, they will, that it will be particularly usable. Second, it's going to be, it's going to be, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I lost my train of thought. Anyway, it's, so basically, there's one problem. Second problem, uh, it's going to be running in a browser and you will have to have a very decent connection for this actually to work, uh, which I can I can imagine that's going to be maybe not a problem for some people in Dublin, but in many other areas, like that's, that's going to be unusable. And uh, of course, there's the privacy aspect. But uh, if you're already using YouTube and Gmail, then obviously that's already forfeited. And uh, third they they have a history of canning things that they did so they might run it for a year then decide oh this doesn't make any sense and just uh and just uh kid kill the service you know two two uh, brief uh clarifications there is one thing you're saying yeah it's it is very first world as in you you're not going to get anybody in in africa probably playing this uh, well, I'm not saying exclusively, but it's 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 very it's less likely than places in Europe or North America. I think they suggest, uh, but like at least twenty to twenty five meg broadband, uh, uh, which uh, a lot of people in the fir- in the first world would would be getting up to or exceeding, but maybe not a lot of people in poor parts of the country or parts of the world. And also the, the second thing I was just going to say is uh, straight off on their announcement, it did seem to be, as you were saying, Linux servers, it seemed to be Linux first is the cool thing. They had two big things up on the screen that said Linux and Vulkan, which is only going to help I mean Valve are doing it by themselves at the moment but I believe that's only going to help developers going in that direction 
Is it? Or are they? So I would recommend everybody to listen to the latest Code Radio where uh, they touched on this and they uh, they raised the point that, yeah, Google Google does these things uh, for on Linux, but is it going to be targeted their specific proprietary-ish version of Linux with some kind of custom APIs? Or is it going to be transferable to gaming on the desktop as well? We we don't know about this. We, as you know, I heard somewhere else uh, somebody pointing at the fact that uh, all Google's inter- infrastructure runs on Linux, but we don't have a Linux Google Drive uh, uh, native client yet. So it's uh, it's it's all it's all up there for discussion and for speculation so far google hasn't released any real facts as far as i know and i don't i i don't trust them to to implement this in so that uh, you know it will be any uh, any much good yeah i have to i have to agree um like while i definitely see connor's point that the uh you're going to get an awful lot of uh you know upstream um updates and stuff like that um, and it will encourage more developers to get into the Linux slash Vulkan space. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's just Google at the end of the day, and I don't. I think they use Linux and they contribute to it quite a lot, and they contribute financially and with code and stuff. But at the same time, it's just th- their their way of doing things is not our way of doing things. So I I don't like someone else you know providing just providing me with a little pipe of data. Like I want that data within my house you know (laughs) and uh yeah it's just another compelling service that they will provide that i just will refuse to use because i don't like the way they do things um i think they have too much power and they're a monopoly and whatnot so you know i try to resist that as much as i can with my own kind of daily computing and my daily digital life or whatever you want to say um but yeah i don't know on the surface maybe it is cool but yeah i don't know I'm I'm not going to use it most likely just out of principle. Uh I will mo- move through the news um very briefly. Uh so there's a new version of wine coming out speaking of Vulcan so it uh, uh now has better Vulcan integration uh improved Vulcan integration and also improved uh media support media API support and uh also, which kind of ties into her discussion, which we'll get into the in a second, there is the next doc two, which is coming out and is uh, coming out on crowdfunding, uh, is Kickstarter, I believe. Um, and so it's a very compelling device. It's something that uh, either a ra- Raspberry Pi or your phone, you'll be able to hook up to your laptop and use that uh, as part of your computing. And so I think it's about time to get into our discussion. So, uh, a convergence device, would you actually use one? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I have to be honest, I would never use one. They're just, I just don't see the point. Um, I have a computer that's nicely converged already. So, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't get the kind of whole convergence thing. Um, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying maybe I just don't see the usefulness in it from my perspective. But yeah, I mean, it certainly is cool, but like it's a curiosity for me. Like, and uh, yeah, I just I I can see definitely a use case for some people, but for me, not so much. I think uh, uh, I think we should define which kind of convergence say so there's the next dog that you just uh, that you just mentioned that's basically uh there's basically a laptop shaped device that has a screen and a keyboard and you plug something like a phone into it which uh, the phone has to have a desktop mode so it has to be one of the newest flagship huawei or flagship samsung's and it would if you plug a phone into it it will run android in desktop mode and you can use the keyboard and the the screen if you plug a raspberry pi into it it with a desktop distribution it will show you the distribution if you plug like a windows uh, compute stick into it it will show you windows 10. Uh, so that's one way of doing conversion next conversion is the uh oh sorry conversion convergence convergence uh, next next idea which is slightly different is the maru os or the uh one of the samsung dexes uh ways of doing it you plug a phone into 
into a screen and connect a keyboard uh, and Bluetooth and uh, mouse via Bluetooth, and suddenly you have uh, instead of Android and desktop mode, you have a Linux distribution that runs as kind of a firmware up on the on the device. And a uh, third way of doing convergence is the uh, purism proposed way they haven't produced it yet is that the applications that they use on the laptops and the applications that they used on the Librem phone are going to be the same and you can uh, and they will work in, independently of the screen size they will scale properly so I think it's important to define which of these uh, which of these types we are talking about uh, I I personally don't really care for the for the one with the with the next dog device or for anything where I have to lug another big thing with me. Uh, it's why why would I just take a laptop or a pine book or something like that? So imagine that you have a device that will take your phone and turn it into a uh, into a into a laptop, but the device is the shape, size, and pretty much the weight of a laptop. Is there any point in that, guys? Do you think? Uh, I'll be inclined to agree. I don't necessarily uh, like the next stock impl implementation of it. Just from running through uh, your the different scenarios there, the Maro OS uh, version is is more appealing to me than the next stock. Uh, the most appealing to me, as you're alluding to, would be the purism purism version, and the reason why is because there are two separate devices. So it's your laptop your, or desktop, and is your phone. You're using the same applications, so you'd have the the same familiarity of you're using whatever LibreOffice on your on your desktop, and you're using LibreOffice. Let's just say I I I don't think they have a, ver a mobile version, but just for the argument, say you're using LibreOffice on your phone, or you're using Google Calendar on your or not Google um, Gnome Calendar on your desktop and Gnome Calendar on your on your um, on your uh, mobile device. So there is that familiarity behind it as long as there's some kind of cloud syncing between the two as in you're writing your your uh your LibreOffice document on and you have some kind of cloud storage which could be provided by purism themselves ideally uh or a, a, a verified uh, third party that is officially sanctioned by purism purism and then as soon as let's say your laptop runs runs out of battery or you close down your laptop and say, okay, I'm going to be commuting home. You could still be updating that document on your bus or train on your commute home or whatever. As long as there's that syncing, I don't mind the two devices. Because you could just say, I'm powering off my, my um, phone because I don't want to receive uh, phone calls right now. I'm powering off my phone, but I'm still able to work on that document. And then as soon as you're, uh, then you're shutting down your laptop because you're like, okay, it's time to go home now. I'm turning my ba phone back on because my wife or girlfriend or son or daughter or whoever wants to contact me may want to contact me. So I am turning on my phone back on, and that seamless uh, transition is very much appealing to me so for me um if that is their idea if that is their implementation their planned implementation of it certainly that would be the the best implementation out of these uh devices that i could see we don't at the moment we don't know about the syncing because uh they proposed some cloud services that they will be preparing uh purism did but uh everything at the moment is uh, up in the air because they don't have a they you know they don't have a product yet but I, I think the cloud services should be available before the phone itself plus obviously uh, this is pretty much down to the app developers so they will have to they could implement uh they could implement uh, the syncing themselves as well with some independent servers and they will also have to implement uh, the scaling and the re uh, rearrangement of the interfaces on for the big app, for the big screens and small screens and for my mouse and keyboard and for and for touch so this is pretty much uh, as long i agree as long as this is done properly it should be a, it should be in, at least in my opinion the best way of doing convergence it's not actually having one device for everything but having uh information that you work with displayed uh, the same information this presented to you 
uh, in a form that is best suited to the device and therefore to the f to the situation you are currently in. So I think that if purism pulls that off, that's definitely better. Uh, uh, I was just going to say for for just a uh, point of clarification, since we alluded to what the purism implementation of it is and what the next stock implementation is, the Morrow OS uh, implementation and very similar but uh, different in a freedom sort of way uh, the Samsung DeX implementation their implementation is your phone is your primary computing device it's, or is the sole computing device and then what you do is you go into your work in, or office environment you plug it into a dock and that dock already has a a monitor a keyboard and mouse hooked up to it so then you plug in your your phone which is the computing device and then a, some sort of desktop appears up on the on the monitor in the case of Morrow OS it's based off uh, Debian and XFCE in the case of Samsung DeX it's their own implementation of 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 Android. Android, I believe you can kind of tweak it to make it look very desktop-like. So uh, that's sample, Samsung's implementation of it. It's, uh, I think you don't, uh, they were originally, Samsung was uh, was uh, making it work with some like deck stock, but these days you only need a cable. Uh, so, so the Maru OS and both the Maru OS and Samsung can connect uh, to the monitor via a cable. And um, Samsung actually has got two different implementation. One of them is... The, of course they do. Yeah, they, it's, it's, it's weird. Like one of them is just Android and Android on their flagships has got desktop mode. Yeah, so so okay. you, which I think is outrageous. Why would anybody want more Android in their life? I don't understand personally. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just... Uh, on the other uh, implementation, which is like kind of kept quiet and aimed squarely at developers, at least on their website, is that you that you download this Ubuntu 16.04 onto your phone. So you download some kind of a Samsung application or that will allow you to install 16.04, a special version of 16.04, I think, on on the on the Note 9 or the Tab 4, I think. So these are 500, 600 euro devices, as far as I remember. You plug a you plug a USB C to HDMI cable into it, and you connect mouse and keyboard, or you can use the Samsung device as a mouse and keyboard. Uh, I think, and uh, you would uh, you have got a decent uh, Linux distribution up on your screen. Uh, it's it's uh, to me the problem with this is well, if I want to, if I had, if I if I was considering spending so much money on a on a phone uh, to buy a Samsung flagship out of all things, then I would probably spend even more on a decent laptop. To me, it comes down again. This is this is a uh, the only the only difference I think it can make is for people who already buy into the Samsung ecosystem and who already have these devices, and they can go and uh, if they if they need to, they can use them as desktops as well. But if you are not willing to spend that much money, uh, then the whole thing kind of is not it doesn't work for you. Uh, the Maru OS implementation is on the other side. You need uh, either you need either a either a Nexus Five, Nexus Five X, or the Galaxy S Nine Plus. So again, ne the Galaxy S Nine Plus is over about five hundred euros or something like that. Uh, the two Nexuses are cheap, so you could use it for people who are very who only can afford one device. They could use this. But uh, from my personal experience, I know that the Nexus, if you buy it now, you spend about hundred and 20, 150 euros, but uh, mine didn't last longer than three months. So they they are at the end of their life at the moment. So I don't know if that's a good idea either. Shane, I'm going to swing it back to you. So you immediately at the start said no. Do you have any more thoughts on this? Um, I mean, yeah, I can only repeat what I said, really. it's uh, I was looking at some of the screenshots and some of the links we have here. And while it looks cool in theory, I mean you can see like a phone hooked up to a, a screen and, and you just see your little desktop there. I mean, I mean, possibly it, it looks fun for, from an experimentation point of view, but I think, yeah, I think the, the, the type of convergence you were talking about Connor is, is something I'd prefer is just everything synced up. 
so um i'm not sure if that's even considered convergence but like that's how i want to do it like i want i do want it to be seamless but i don't want to have to start like docking things i mean some point in the future we could have a situation where your computer is your phone um and it's powerful enough to do absolutely everything so it can serve as laptop desktop mobile device and you know you you dock it in that sense so you go into work you dock it you go home you dock it that does sound kind of cool or maybe even wirelessly dock it like maybe that, that that's certainly a possibility uh the maru os can already wirelessly dock in a way because they can use chromecast to connect a monitor i was literally going to say that it's, oh, that's it's, cool it's, you know the, the, if if you don't if you discount purism uh, because they don't have a product yet out of all of the rest the maru os i think are the best in my opinion because they uh they they use lineage os rather than some proprietary uh android implementation so they recently switched to lineage and they give you uh, they give you a real linux distribution rather than uh android and desktop mode like uh like one version of uh, samsung and like the next dog does so that's uh, and they they propose that you can use uh, that you can use uh, some Chromecast to connect connect the phone to the monitor. It's probably quite it might there might be some lag I'd imagine, but it's uh, I think they are going the right way. If if what you want to achieve is to use your phone for everything, the Mario OS way is in my opinion the best one. So, Mike, I believe you're going to resurrect the boner section. So, how's your zombie boner? <laughs> well, I have a I have a boner for bottle, and that's not my admission of alcoholism or anything. But uh, that's uh, bottle is a Python library that uh, lets you run a a, a, a Python based uh, server side uh, system. So, imagine like PHP but Python. And uh, it makes a really it's it makes uh, stuff like routing really easy. And I was using it at work for something, and it's an amazing project. I mean, it's called Bottle because there is a bigger project called Flask, which is like a full-on Python-based CMS. And uh, I find Flask impl- uh, intimidating, and it does too many things, and it's very it has got quite a steep learning for, curve. So, for us who can't handle Flask, Bottle is the way to go. Yeah, I actually have an unexpected uh, boner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hate when that happens. Um, uh, happens to me all the time on the bus. <laughs> I was, uh, oh God. <laughs> I was, uh, I was uh, so uh, I was checking, as you might have seen recently, I was checking out a Godot game engine. So that's my boner for this week because I was going through the tutorials and um, just trying to learn how to use it. And uh, I think my kind of, training wheels kind of project like that I took directly from the documentation is is very educational it's very good but um I think to start to wet my feet I'm gonna maybe try to create a breakout clone because I love the game breakout so I really want to it seems like a simple one to implement so yeah Godot is my boner of the week so that's the end of our boner section um if you guys have been enjoying what we've been doing we do have a support us section, so whether you want to buy us a beer or whatever, uh, we do have various things, PayPal, uh, various ways of supporting us. So on our website, there is a support us section. So uh, this will always be free, so don't worry about that. Uh, but uh, if you ever want to throw us a fiver or whatever to buy us a beer, it's greatly appreciated. Also, if you want to rant and rave and t- tell us that we've been absolutely shit with this podcast, you're <laughs> perfectly entitled to do that. And our contact us section is on our website. We are on Telegram. Um, and we have a lot of humorous uh, conversations in our Telegram. Um, we are on YouTube. We're on Twitter, at Linux Lads. Uh, f- we're on that dreaded thing called Facebook, uh, which... Who knows, we may change that in the future, but for the moment we are on Facebook. We are on Mastodon, which is actually quite good. We are getting a lot of um, interaction on Mastodon. And if you want to uh, give us uh, any kind of feedback, positive or negative, uh, trust me, we have we have had negative feedback, so we welcome that as well. 
is show at linuxlads.com. And in case you didn't believe us, we actually do believe it, or we do exist in real life. Uh, in case you want to go up and poke us in the eye or whatever. Uh, we, <laughs> so if you want to uh, hang out with us in real life, uh, we do. We are part of a meetup, so uh, that link will also be in the contact us section. So we have been the Linux Lads, and I have been your host for this podcast. My name is Connor. I have been Mike. And I'm Shane. See you guys.